just put yourself back in in this time frame and you know you're studying your Gracie Jiu Jitsu and the guy down the street is studying capoeira and then there's another guy over there who does Greco and then there's another guy over there who does catch wrestling and and essentially nobody likes each other that nobody cross trains and everyone's like well fuck you my style's the best and uh I'm going to challenge you a lot of these guys are thugs and gangsters as we're shortly going to hear about and uh it's it's kind of a crazy time where it's like you know it's my style versus your style and you don't know my secrets at this point techniques are very very secretive what's the most efficient path to victory against this particular opponent he's dropping off the choke here we could see the finish it's looking tight tight to Delper. hello welcome to the essential jiu-jitsu podcast i'm your host matt kwan the essential jiu-jitsu podcast is everything you need to know about jiu-jitsu and this week we are doing part two of the history of BJJ, Transitions. I hope you enjoyed last week's episode. We discussed the development of Japanese Jiu-Jitsu at the time known as Kuryu Jiu-Jitsu and how there was a bit of a Newaza revolution. Um, certain individuals such as Jugoro Kano developing Kodokan Judo to take over essentially Kuryu Jiu-Jitsu and then individuals like Mate Montanabe of Fusion Rio Jiu-Jitsu, who challenged the Kodokan and exposed their weakness in the area of ground grappling. And then essentially Jigoro Kano invited him aboard and absorbed his style of Jiu-Jitsu into the Kodokan, having more of a complete approach to Judo. And that's kind of where we left off. So this week is going to be a uh, pretty big episode. I'm hoping to get it all within an hour, but you never know how that's going to work out. Um, before we get started, please like, share, subscribe, leave comments where you can. If you want to support the show, I will leave links in the bottom. Buy my kid's book, subscribe to my online academy. Every little bit helps. And just talk about the podcast. Share it with your friends if you enjoy it. Okay, uh, before we get back to the history portion... I just want to discuss the contrasting, the differences between Japanese Jiu-Jitsu and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, because today we're going to be discussing how this Japanese style of Jiu-Jitsu turned in, uh, how it transitioned to Japan in the form of Judo and essentially became BJJ and how BJJ gained its notoriety and really became what it is today. So first, let's just contrast Japanese Jiu-Jitsu with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So I think one of the biggest differences between Japanese Jiu-Jitsu, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is the training methodology. So Japanese Jiu-Jitsu is very much focused on kata, which is a pre-organized dance almost where you are performing moves on a cooperative opponent. Whereas Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, there's not a lot of kata. Now uh, the training methodology for BJJ is generally randori. And this is where, this is where Jigoro Kano really stood out in implementing randori as the main teaching and training method and we can tell that tanabe also did the exact same thing because his stuff worked really good against resisting opponents except it was more ground fighting based another difference between bjj and japanese jiu-jitsu is the positional strategy portion of it and we're going to talk about maeda's approach his theory to combat uh, we'll talk about strategies and things like that. But essentially, BJJ is focused more around achieving a dominant position, uh, w which allows certain moves to happen, whereas Japanese Jiu-Jitsu was essentially a culmination of tricks and moves. And there was no real system as to a hierarchy, a hierarchy of positions that will get you to dominant positions. So uh, another thing that's very different is the point system. So BJJ, obviously, we have the uh, IBJJF scoring system, which is kind of, I guess, the original point system. Now there's other point systems. There's grappling industries. There's ADCC. There's all different types of uh, rule sets that you can find. But the IBJJF rule set, the point system, essentially awards certain positions in the hierarchy for the amount of damage that you can do to an opponent due to a submission or strikes. So that was another thing that really is the big difference between Japanese Jiu-Jitsu and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Um, another big one is... Japanese jiu-jitsu has a lot of so-called deadly techniques, you know, fish hooking, hair pulling, eye gouging, biting, dirty moves, foul play, essentially groin strikes. These are not safe moves to train on a daily basis at full intensity, 
Whereas Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu has removed all of these foul moves and do, in doing so, you can train 100% against live resistance on a daily basis, leave the, the gym uninjured. When you've gone full resistance with your training partners, you come back the next day, you can do it all over again. So in removing these foul tactics and these so-called deadly techniques, BJJ actually has become more realistic in training environment because in Japanese Jiu-Jitsu, you just cannot do these moves 100%. Um, and also BJJ has revised a lot of these traditional techniques from Japanese Jiu-Jitsu to work for a smaller opponent when fighting against a larger or a stronger opponent. And it has focused heavily on the idea of, uh, it really emphasizes things like efficiency and leverage, right? And and not just like muscling through moves that are, like I said, so-called deadly moves, okay? Keep in mind that Japanese Jiu-Jitsu requires a lot of fine motor movements. So things like attacks on the eyes, the wrists, the fingers, etc. Like these dirty moves require um, like small muscle groups. So my fingers are going to do things like that. I'm going to gouge you with my fingers and things like that. These fine motor movements are pretty difficult to do in full stress situations. Whereas BJJ has adopted techniques that rely on gross motor movements. So big muscle groups, right? That's And, and these... These muscle groups are more reliable in a combat situation. So using like, you know, your core, uh, the big muscle groups in your legs and your hips and your glutes to apply leverage and finish a submission or to hold a dominant position for long periods of time. So that's a huge one. Gross motor movements using those big muscle groups as opposed to using small muscle groups. And I think this is a reason why um, I struggle with gi a lot is because it does require a lot of work with your fingers, you know. You ever try and barambolo someone and get that pant grip with your fingers? Sometimes it can be difficult to to do things like this in a fully stressful situation. It takes practice, it takes reps, and uh, quite honestly, for me, it takes a lot of tape to be able to use my fingers in situations like this. I don't have the strongest hands. All right, um, <clears throat> and Kano heavily regulated the rules of judo. I believe it was in 1925 he did this. And his goal was to prevent the, uh, the sport of judo from being completely dominated by Neiwaza because the guys from from uh, Fusion Rio Jiu-Jitsu were dominating the Kodokan judo in these so-called challenge matches, right? There is, um, there is a type of judo that focuses on Neiwaza. It's called Kozen judo. It actually is still around today. It is not uh, an Olympic sport to my knowledge, but it is it heavily focuses on Neiwaza and it basically mostly resembles modern BJJ and, uh, and not, uh, not judo, right? This, this is like where you can fight on the ground for longer periods of time, but it is technically still a, I guess, a branch of judo, right? Fusion Rio Jiu Jitsu, it resembles modern Jiu Jitsu. Uh, but like I had mentioned earlier, the Fusion Rio after becoming absorbed by Kodokan judo, it kind of faded away. And so did Motemon Tanabe, okay? I also wanted to just, before we go back into the history lesson, I wanted to discuss something, again, references from that book John Danner and Henzo Gracie wrote, Mastering Jiu-Jitsu. Danner talks about the explanation of the different spellings of Jiu-Jitsu because you're going to see a, a whole lot of different spellings on Jiu-Jitsu. The common Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu that we know is spelt J I U. And then jitsu, and sometimes it's hyphenated. Okay, but when we were speak, when we uh, in respects to Japanese jiu-jitsu and fusion Rio jiu-jitsu, Koryu jiu-jitsu, the traditional jiu-jitsu, it's generally spelled J U jitsu. So without the I. So I would say um, the J U is actually the so-called correct spelling. However, when the sport transitioned to Brazil and moved to the West it was mistakenly spelt Jiu-J-I-U. And since this was the most common spelling when the Gracies kind of were coming to power and prominence, that is the, is the spelling that stuck. So it's almost like a tradition to have the spelling J-I-U. And when you see that spelling, that refer, refers to the Brazilian style, whereas Jiu-Jitsu without the I, J-U-Jitsu, essentially refers to Japanese jiu-jitsu. So a little bit of an explanation there on the different spellings of jiu-jitsu that you might run into. Okay, so 
Now, let's get into the history lesson of it all. We're going to talk about a guy named, uh, first of all, Yukio Tani. So we're going to talk about a lot of different characters in this episode. Tons of information coming at you guys, and I hope, I hope uh, you know, it's not too boring for you. So this guy, Yukio Tane, he was born in 1881. He died in 1950. He was a student of Fusen Ryo. And Tani, he's one of the more well-known students from this Fusen Ryo uh, academy. And he is said to have been training under a guy named Torajiro and also Matemon Tanabe. This guy is, again, just like a lot of these characters, he's not a big guy. He's five feet tall, 125 pounds. And like I'd mentioned, the Fusen Ryo, they had really valued the randori as the, the main training method for, for their art, right? Live training versus live resistance. And that truly is, I think, the best way that you're going to get training that'll work in a realistic situation because you're getting, you know, live resistance, live reactions, realistic training. And um, the, this type of training only works if the two combatants agree to stop once a submission is locked in, obviously. Otherwise, you cannot use randori as a, as a live training method. If the two guys don't agree to stop once the arm is locked in and the person gives up, then you're going to have broken arms and the, the training's not real. So for randori training to be accepted in this Fusen Rio style, when a submission is locked in, someone gives up, we have to respect that, we let them go. We all know this, right? And so uh, the Fusen Rio, as we discussed, they removed all the deadly techniques because it just wasn't it just wasn't safe in a daily training environment. There was excessive injuries. OK, and this this approach proved to be way more useful compared to the traditional kata of Koryu Jiu Jitsu um, because it is live resistance after all. And around 19 years old, Tani moved to England. So he went from Japan to England. He went to spread his Fusen Rio Jiu Jitsu. OK, so he is not a member of the Kodakon yet. He is going there as a representative of this ground fighting jiu-jitsu. Uh, it, it was around 1900, and he went there with his brother after being invited by a gentleman named Edward William Barton Wright. Okay, so Edward Barton Wright, he was uh, ethnically English, but he was born in Bangalore, India, and this guy traveled the whole world. He's known as a pioneer of the idea of hybrid or mixed martial arts, and he studied in Europe. He worked all over the world. While he was working in Japan, he started studying jiu-jitsu. He was incredibly fascinated with like self-defense systems. And he actually later opened a martial arts academy in England that he called Bart Jitsu, which is kind of hilarious if you ask me. It's a great name. He just named it after himself. This is that's like me calling uh my style of jiu-jitsu Quan Jitsu or Matt Kwando or something funny like that, right? So he he develops this so-called hybrid martial art with different styles. He calls it Bart Jitsu. Bar Jitsu is a, was a combination of many martial arts. He described it as a new art of self-defense. He studied sports like boxing, grappling, wrestling, fencing, and savat. Savat is a French kickboxing style where two combatants wear shoes. And fencing is, of course, um, it's an Olympic sport. It's where two combatants try and stab each other with swords. So he's, you know, he's very well versed in combat sports, clearly very, very fascinated in martial arts. Uh, this Yukio Tani guy, his goal was to open a school in England, but uh, the school idea actually kind of failed. It, it didn't pan out the way that he wanted. And so he actually partnered with a strong man, a Scottish guy named William Bankier. And this strong man, uh, pro wrestler, William Bankier, he was like a showman, right? And he... Uh, they kind of were an act where they worked together and they did like demonstrations. And then they, uh, Tani would begin to wrestle all comers at these clubs that they would perform at for money. Okay. So more challenge matches. We're going to talk a lot about challenge matches in this episode. It's going to, it's a huge part of the history of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is these so-called challenge matches. So Essentially, these patrons would come, they'd watch this show with uh, William Bank here and Yuki Otani. They would demonstrate moves on each other and then they would go to the crowd and say, hey, does anyone want to try and wrestle this small Japanese man? Uh, and if they could last with him for five minutes, they would get a certain amount of money. If they could last for him for, for 10 minutes, they would get more money. In 15 minutes, they'd get even more money and so on, so on. But they, uh, the only catch was these guys had to wear gis, okay? So the classic judo gi, Tani would put them in a gi, and uh, generally these are grappling matches. So there's no strikes allowed, no fouls allowed. Um, it is said that Yukio Tani averaged around 40 or 50 opponents a week. So this guy is getting a lot of matches in. 
and he's basically beating the shit out of everyone. He became quite wealthy from these challenge matches in England and well known as the invulnerable Japanese wrestler. Uh, he wrestled average Joes, brawlers, strongmen, English wrestlers, uh, catch wrestlers, all, all different types of people, people that are much bigger than him and was very, very successful in these grappling matches, okay? Um, around this time, Jigoro Kano, that, you know, as we discussed in the first episode, the creator of Kodokan Judo, he traveled to, ju uh, to England to expand his Judo, right? His vision was for Judo not just to be the national sport in Japan and not just to improve the culture and the society and the public school system of Japan with Judo, but he wanted Judo to be around the world. He wanted to spread it internationally, and so he offered Tani uh, the position of the Kodokan representative in, English, in England, and this is a very prestigious uh, position, okay? And Tani accepted this offer and immediately was promoted to black belt in Judo, and just like Fusen Ryo and Mate Montanabe, now Tani has become absorbed by this organized judo movement and has been swallowed up. Uh, essentially, this movement that Jigoro Kano is using to monopolize the jujitsu judo landscape at the time, right? And I guess, <laughs> I guess uh, Jigoro Kano kind of took the approach, if you can't beat him, join him type thing, right? Like, or join me, I should say, if you can't beat him. All right. So, th and that's, that's a little background on this guy, Yukio Tani. So now let's talk about a guy who is one of the most pivotal characters in the birth of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Uh, his name is Mitsuyo Meida. Okay. He's, he's also known as uh, Otavio Meida. I believe that's what the Brazilians called him, but his real name, Mitsuyo Meida. He's a judo pioneer. He traveled the, the world, the U.S., Central America, Brazil, and other countries. Uh, this guy was born in 1878, and he passed away in 1941. So this Mitsuo Meda guy, he was uh, also not a big guy. He was 5'4", about 141 pounds, but like quite built. There's pictures of him. He's pretty jacked, but again, a small guy, uh, as many Japanese people are. Uh, he was sometimes he's sometimes referred to as the father of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So there are obviously lots of people like that, but he is one of the main guys who kind of brought uh, judo and the Neowaza from Japan and brought it to Brazil, where it could be re further refined by the Gracie family, which we're shortly going to talk about. So, anyways, he was uh, originally a student of traditional Japanese Jiu Jitsu, but he switched to Kodokan Judo in the year of 1896. Maeda, uh, he, he, he was highly ranked in the Kodokan for his skills. He's very, very skilled grappler, this guy. And he was there. He witnessed this uh, so-called Neowaza revolution where the Kodokan, where they lost their challenge matches to Fuse and Rio. So he's, he saw the, uh, you know, he saw the so-called unbeatable Kodokan who was so successful in these challenge matches start getting their asses kicked by these Fuse and Rio guys and the Matamon Tanabe and whatnot. And, and he was there for that, right? And uh, th this um, Maida guy, and, and again, Maida, there's a jiu-jitsu brand named after him. It's kind of a household name in jiu-jitsu. Uh, it is said that he would, when he would be in training, he would throw experienced people and, exper and inexperienced people all the same, as if they were the same skill level. So it wouldn't matter if he was going against someone who's brand new or someone who's a third degree Dan in judo, he would try and throw them uh, just as hard. And he said he would do it to show them respect. However, this often frightened lower rank students. You know, if you're brand new to judo, if you ever walked into a judo room and you don't know how to fall, you know, forward you can it can be intimidating going with a black belt because you, at any time you're going to fall. You don't know when you're going to get thrown and you're, you're not necessarily the best at th getting thrown yet. And so this guy, he said, Hey, I'm going to throw everyone the same because I want to treat you with the same respect that I would treat a black belt. And of course, this uh, obviously frightens some people. Um, in Europe, it is said that he won all but two matches. So again, just a quick disclaimer as we continue with this episode, there's going to be dates and um, and events that people might dispute and say, hey, Matt, you got your dates wrong. You, you, uh, you know, it actually went down like this. 
I'm just, uh, guys, I'm not a historian. I'm just, uh, I did my research and I'm trying to give you the best information that I can. So I do apologize if maybe my facts do not match up with yours. Please forgive me. So anyways, he, uh, when he was on his European tour, this made a guy, he did challenge matches and they it said that he won all of them, but two, okay? Uh, he competed with and without the gi in a variety of different rules. Catch wrestling, um, obviously grappling, and uh, it, that could be like judo style, fusion Rio style, jiu-jitsu, different disciplines, um, and also uh, potentially no holds barred matches. Okay, this guy Mado was sent to the U.S. in 1904 uh, to spread judo again internationally by Jigoro Kano, and he was one of Kano's top students for sure. But after spending a little bit of time in the states, Maeda left the states. Oh, Apparently because they didn't really like Asians too much in the early 1900s, which makes sense, right? And so he traveled the world looking for challenge matches similar to uh, this Yuki Otani guy. Now, keep in mind back then, these uh, this international colonization almost of Japan where they sort of spread and they're sending Japanese judoka all over the world to try and spread judo. There's essentially four ways that these judoka can make money doing this right like number one demonstrations so they're showing katas with a willing uh accepting training partner who is allowing demonstrations to happen to show the effect as an effectiveness of judo to these crowds another way is challenge matches which is a huge way that they can make money a lot of these characters became pretty wealthy doing these challenge matches basically out grappling the shit out of rubes uh, another thing that these guys often did was they contacted the local police and military and started teaching them grappling techniques. And then the fourth method would be opening academies and gathering students and teaching teaching people jujitsu and making money that way. So kind of different ways that, you know, once they immigrate to these different countries, how are they going to actually make a living and how are they going to make a sustainable lifestyle teaching ju judo or uh, jujitsu, right? So... It is estimated that Mitsuyo Almeida has won over 2,000 fights, uh, and many of them, like I said, being Valley Tudo matches. No holds barred, few rules, um, but nothing can be confirmed. Uh, there isn't full concrete res uh, resources on all of these fights, but it is estimated he's, he's won over 2,000 fights. Didn't win all of them, but his percentage is pretty damn high. And so he traveled to Cuba, Mexico, Central America, doing these challenge matches. And um, he was victorious against a lot of people, people of all different sizes and disciplines. And just like uh, Tani, his act would consist of kata, where he would demonstrate these moves on fellow Kodakan teammates. And these teammates, he, tra he traveled the, the world with these teammates. They later became known as the Four Kings of Cuba. There's a couple of different guys from the Kodakan, a couple of different black belts that he would travel with. He would do kata with them and demonstrate. And then this would be followed again by open challenge matches to observers. Um, kind of like some videos you see on social media where guys are at the beach and they're, you know, high level wrestlers go to the beach and they're like, hey, who wants to challenge me for money? You know, if you can take me down, I'll give you 50 bucks, this type of shit, right? And uh, making a lot of money because they see this little Japanese guy and they're like, hey, man, I could take this guy down. I could take him. And then you grapple with him. You're like, holy shit, you're getting twisted. You're getting strangled. And a lot of people, uh, <laughs> a lot of people lost money that way. So a cool thing about Maeda, let's just talk about his, uh, his nickname. Danaher writes in this book, Mastering Jiu-Jitsu, uh, that Maeda took on a stage name called Count Comde or Conde Coma, as I've seen certain posters that reference Maeda. They refer to him as Conde Coma, which basically means uh, Count Combat or Count Trouble. Like, I'm the Count of Trouble. And this is essentially a play on words for the Spanish term for combat and the Japanese word for trouble. And, we'll, and as Dan Hur says in this book, Mastering Jiu-Jitsu, it insinuates that he was the, quote, prince of combat who is constantly in trouble, quote. So uh, kind of a cool, fun nickname. Count, uh, Count Conde Coma is the name that I see pop up repeatedly for Mitsuyo Omeda. He was known as Conde Coma. Now, shortly around the start of World War I, this was, I believe, uh, the date was around September 1914, Maida was traveling through Central America, and this led him further south to the country of Peru, 
and eventually to Brazil. And Maeda traveled to Brazil with a fellow Kodakon teammate named uh, Soishiro Sataki. And uh, Soishiro Sataki, he became the founder of the first registered judo academy in Brazil in 1914. So, you know, all these judoka, these black belts from Kodakon were traveling in a troop, essentially performing with each other and helping each other spread judo and and landing all over the world and sort of trying to spread the the grappling arts. Now, this move was part of Japan's national program of immigration to Brazil and to other countries because Japan at this time was desiring to become a, a colonial power such as the great powers of in, uh, in, of Europe that were literally about to start murdering each other, Germany, France, England, these were all colonial powers. And Japan wanted a piece of that, right? Like they were kind of sick of this previous economic um, isolation that we discussed in the previous episode. And now they wanted to branch out. They wanted to be almost westernized in this way and have more land and more colonies around the world. And so they're sending people to colonize these countries all over the place. And Maeda came to Brazil and he loved it there. He said that it was a super suitable place for the Japanese to live. And that's why, you know, nowadays we see a huge Japanese population in the country of Brazil. So in around 1918, Maeda, he accepted a match against this famous capoeira fighter named Pedebola, or perhaps in Portuguese, it would be Pedjebola. And this guy was big. He was 6'2", 220 pounds, and uh, it is said that Maeda even allowed this Pejabola guy to use a knife. And even so, Maeda quickly won the match. So Maeda's skills, uh, if this story is true, his skills greatly outclassed this Pejabola capoeira fighter. And even with a knife, he was able to quickly win the match with his grappling prowess. Pretty interesting. Sometimes Maeda's matches were gi, sometimes they were no gi. Uh, they varied greatly in rules, sometimes street fights, other times grappling matches. So he's a very diverse fighter who's very adaptable. And because of these different styles that he had to encounter, he quickly had to adapt his Kodakon judo for these different threats, such as striking, wrestling, maybe even weapons, right? And, and uh, it kind of just is a testament to the ability of this Mitsuo Meta character to be able to handle all these different styles. And as he's fighting these different guys from different disciplines, he's also adding new techniques to his Kodakon Judo. He's taking things that he sees that works from these catch wrestling um, disciplines and things like that, and he's incorporating it, much like we do with Jiu-Jitsu today. With, with Jiu-Jitsu, Jiu-Jitsu is kind of like a, I don't know, it's, it's explicit word. Uh, it's kind of like a horror, right? It, it takes everything from all different disciplines, whatever works Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu will take and absorb it. And that's kind of how we do it, right? We we don't discriminate against wrestling because it doesn't, you know, it's not considered traditional jujitsu. When we see something that works in jujitsu, we take it. If it works, we want to we want to do it, right? And this guy, that was kind of his whole thing. And so he is now accumulating tons of experience fighting these different guys and really making his Kodakan judo something else, something different from when he left Japan first. Maeda really put an emphasis on the idea of closing the distance in a fight using the clinch to take an opponent down. And then when you take someone down, now their striking skills, once they're on the ground, are very, very useless. And he realized this, right? He, he realized that there was an overarching strategy to hand-to-hand -hand combat, and that's why he was so effective against these guys. Whereas Japanese jiu-jitsu more like a collection of moves. You know, if someone gets close enough to me and I can poke them in the eyes, that type of shit, right? So he really looked at it, things from a systemic point of view. We're going to look at his combat philosophy very closely in a moment here. So once on the ground, he used a series of pins and submissions to defeat his opponent, just like we do in modern jiu-jitsu. And in doing this, Mitsuyo Meda was like a really revolutionary individual in his approach to fighting and he would use his grappling to defeat boxers he would use submissions to defeat wrestlers from the guard so if you're a boxer he would be able to close the distance take you down submit you if you're a wrestler he would pull guard and use his guard to submit you right and uh yeah he died in 1941 of kidney disease he was a seventh degree black belt and he died in the city of Belém, Brazil. And Belém, we're going to talk about a little bit later when we talk about the Gracie family. That's where the Gracie's family, family is from. So his combat philosophy, he passed on his training methods to uh, the Gracie's. 
and we're going to quickly learn about how the Gracies got to know Maida, but he passed these training methods on to the Gracie families, uh, the Gracie family he, that he employed at the Kodokan Judo. So again, revolving around the idea of Randori, uh, combining the throws of the Kodokan Judo and the ground fighting of Fusen Ryu, uh, Newaza Revolution, and the non-traditional techniques that he learned from his challenge matches with catch wrestlers and boxers and, and other, other individuals. So it's really, he's, he's really creating a hybrid grappling style, gi or no gi for almost any combatant. And he taught this strategy, um, these so-called phases of combat, close the distance, get to the clinch, take your opponent down where they can be controlled. And then from there in a dominant position, you can finish the fight. And this approach is actually the approach that, uh, Hoist Gracie became known for in the early days of USC. It is, it's essentially the blueprint for the BJJ approach to fighting. We're going to talk about Hoist Gracie later on in the episode, but if you watch Hoist Gracie, the description of combat I just gave you basically describes what he would do inside of the octagon. Um, and then around 1920s, mid 1920s, Maeda actually would go on to focus on the Japanese colonization project in Brazil and other surrounding countries. And so the Gracies would continue studying and teaching jiu-jitsu, uh, specifically Carlos and Helio Gracie would continue this study of jiu-jitsu full-time in Brazil. We're going to talk about these Gracie brothers, obviously, pretty quickly. So um, the Gracie brothers, you know, they, they would issue challenge matches around the 1920s, 1930s. These Carlos and Helio Gracie issued these challenge matches, often in times no rules involved, uh, Valley Tudo matches, and this would help the Gracies great, gain, um, you know, a great reputation for their fighting system. And over time, with these challenge matches, the system was refined, and the Gracies updated their tactics and their techniques. And it's it's important to know that these guys are not big. The Carlos and Helio are not large in in stature. They focused a lot of their fighting system from the guard, taking the bottom position and fighting off of their backs, much like we do. Uh, you know, uh, well, I do. I'm a butt scooting guard puller sack of shit, <laughs> and we, we love fighting off of our backs. The I, the Gracies did not invent the idea of the guard. There's lots of talk about the guard in the Nawaza Revolution that previously happened in Japan a few decades ago, but they really did. Uh, they'd really refined it for real fight scenarios when it would be difficult to take someone down. They would play guard, right? And they also moved away from the main focus of wrestling pins and judo pins because in a real fight, just because you pin someone on their back, that doesn't necessarily mean that the fight is over, okay? So the Gracies and Matsuyo Meda, they shifted their focus to getting behind someone and putting them belly down in the prone position in like the most dominant position in fighting, I would say. So Gracie Jiu-Jitsu was originally created to be an effective real life scenario and there uh to work in a real life scenario and therefore it prioritized pins that would maximize one's ability to land damage in a real fight situation and that's why the as i mentioned earlier the ibjjf points hierarchy is what it is that's why mount and the back are worth four points and neon belly is worth two points and passing the guard is worth three points etc etc it really prioritizes the most dominant positions in a fight and when you contrast this with judo or wrestling when a match ends when you just throw someone on their back right in jiu-jitsu bjj i should say we realize that just because someone's shoulders are pinned to the floor that doesn't mean the fight is over often in jiu-jitsu the fight has just begun right and so uh we you know talking about these the hierarchy of systems the dominant positions this is really what made Mitsuyo meda and the gracie jiu-jitsu system it set it apart from other systems is they really want to, they understand that there's a spectrum of positions on the ground from good positions to neutral positions to bad positions. And it prioritizes putting yourself in good positions and preventing yourself or escaping from so-called bad positions. And you can contrast this to the uh, outdated methodology of the Koryo Jiu-Jitsu, the traditional Japanese Jiu-Jitsu. It's just, it's just shit. It's just a bunch of moves basically. And when the guy's close enough, you can just ugh, poke their eye out or, uh, you know, pull your knife out and stab him or whatever, but you never get to actually try that. You never get to actually spar that because now you've 
potentially murdered your teammate, right? You can't, you can't train that move at a hundred percent. So, um, the Gracie's really developed like these sophisticated ways to advancing and maintaining, controlling these dominant positions where essentially these un unanswered strikes and submissions could be employed and, and it got really, really good at escaping bad pins and bad submissions. And they found that, Hey, certain dominant positions will force an opponent to make a mistake in a fight and it makes submissions much easier. But on the other hand of this, the dominant positions make it really, really hard for your opponent to submit and to strike you. And so that's where the positional aspect of Gracie Jiu Jitsu really shines through. Okay. Um, and then you, you know, using this like IBJJF point system, you know, maybe you're someone who hates it. Maybe you love the point system. I see value in it. And uh, I, I've, I've ha I have a mixed feeling about the point system, but I think that it is overall a good thing. Using this point system, we can regularly train the game of BJJ with realistic goals, and we can build strong positional habits that increase your chances of success in a real fight or even in a cage fight in MMA. All right, now we're going to start talking about the Gracies. So um, there are, I believe, five brothers and a couple of sisters, but the main brothers you're probably going to hear about are Carlos and Helio. All right, these are like the two main brothers. They were sons of a man named Gustavo Gracie. And Carlos Gracie, he was born in 1902. He died in 1994. Helio Gracie, he was born in 1913, died in 2009. They're both 10th degree red belts in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, or also known as grandmasters in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, born in the town of Belém, Brazil. Now, this Matsuo Meda guy, he befriended a Scottish Brazilian man named Gastão Gracie. Also, Gastão Gracie had a circus. He ran a circus show. Uh, the Gracie brothers, I'll just name them right here. There's Carlos, there's Helio, um, Oswaldo, Gastão Jr., and George. Okay, And they all train jiu-jitsu, but the main ones we hear about are Carlos and Helio. Um, Carlos is the oldest of the, of the eight children, okay? And he was also kind of known to be this aggressive, mischievous fight, uh, mischievous child. He was getting into fights. He was getting expelled from school on multiple occasions. Kind of a shit disturber, okay? And Helio, he's in the lore of jiu-jitsu. He's often depicted as a small, weak man, but he was actually pretty athletic. He was a swimmer. He was a rower. Uh, that's what's commonly known I would say throughout the course of my research is that, hey, this guy's actually, he was in good shape. He was pretty athletic. He's not just like this little weakling guy um, as legend would have it. So anyways, at 15 years old, the, uh, Carlos's father, Gastão, he owned this circus show and he took Carlos to see this pro wrestling challenge, which involved Mitsuo Meda, right? And Mitsuo Meda, he's with his troop of, of his uh, Japanese judoka friends. They do a show and then they challenge people for money. And Carlos is in the crowd and he's, he's, uh, he's watching this. And he became interested in learning from Mitsuo Meda after he saw him beat the shit out of, a, out of an older, or, or sorry, not an older, but a much larger, much stronger man. And so he began training judo. So at this point, Mitsuo Meda, he's becoming quite well known. He's becoming wealthy in Brazil. He's known for his success and his challenge matches. And he agrees, okay, I'll teach my skills to uh, Carlos Gracie. And he, Carlos trained with him for four years before Maeda moved off to different parts of, of Brazil to continue with this colonization that Japan, this national colonization project that Japan had for the, uh, for the, for the world essentially. And for the spreading of the art of judo to the world. Now, Carlos Gracie, he opened a school in Brazil in 1925 in his early twenties after just four years of training under Meta. And this is a similar situation to Jigoro Kano. If you remember in the last episode, he opened his Kodakon after, you know, just a few years of training in, uh, in Japan. And, <clears throat> Um, after Maida did leave to focus on this colonization project, Carlos started training under a man named Donato Pires, and that was in a place, uh, a city, Rio de Janeiro. So I believe the Gracies picked up after a couple of years and they moved to Rio de Janeiro. Uh, I'm also going to mention a, a sort of like a backstory on Carlos Gracie. He, uh, 
he, he was a big follower, follower of alternative medicine and the occult. So it, it, apparently he was into this occult type shit because of the result of an early death of one of his girlfriends. And he was a big follower, follower of a woman named Helena Blavatsky, who is a mystic. And a, he was part of this religion, or at least a believer in the religion called theosophy. And theosophy is a, it's kind of like a, it's like a spiritual religious movement created in the 19th century. Okay. So this guy is like spiritual. He's into uh, speaking with spirits and, and, you know, he's, he's big into the occult essentially. And he was also very, very into nutrition as a means of medicine. And maybe you've heard of the Gracie diet, which is something that is still common today. I believe there's books on this. Um, he developed this diet known as the Gracie diet. It focuses on essentially eliminating certain foods and substances as a means to manage the, the theory is manage the pH level in the blood. And this holistic approach to diet and nutrition prevents illness. So he was very much into nutrition and the occult and spirits. Um, and, uh, yeah, he, Kind of an interesting guy. So we're going to come back to the Gracies in a sec. Now I want to just shift focus to a gentleman who was a kind of a part of this whole situation as well. His name was Gioji Gio Omori. So his, his real name is actually Gioji Omori, but uh, he adopted the name Gio Omori. And this guy is also a Japanese Kodokan judoka who traveled with Maeda and settled in Brazil. Just like Maeda, he is considered one of the founders of BJJ. You can look him up. Uh, he is one of the, quote, fathers of jiu-jitsu. And he started training at the Kodokan in Japan at eight years old. He got his black belt in judo at 17 years old. And he, he, this guy is also a guy who fought challenge matches against boxers, catch wrestlers, capoeira fighters, vale tudo. If you don't know what capoeira is, it's essentially like a it's almost like a dance. It's like a gymnastic style of striking and potentially has grappling. I'm not very well versed in it, but guys are doing like cartwheels and kicking each other in the head and uh, very, very aware with their body movements and good control. And like I said, very gymnastic like martial art. And so he's fighting these capoeira fighters. He's fighting valet tudo fighters. And he, this guy is like really well known for his technique. Like he had refined his technique to adapt to fighting all these different fighters from these different disciplines. This Amore guy, he was also a teacher of both George and Carlos Gracie. And uh, he began training at the Gracie gym in the year of 1929. Now, after this, Amore actually had disputes with the Gracie family. So they were, uh, they were kind of beefing for whatever reason, and Carlos challenges him to a fight. Now, Amore, he originally declined this match, saying that, uh, you know, Carlos, he's no match for me. Um, uh, but apparently after this constant taunting from Carlos, he accepts the match with Carlos, okay? In the, the first fight, it was slated for January 5th, 1930 at a circus, and Gustavo Gracie, legend has it, he tried to bribe Omori to let his son win the fight. Essentially, they were, tra <laughs> they were trying to make it a, a, a work. They were trying to rig the fight so that, you know, Omori gets beat by Carlos Gracie. Instead, they decided that the fight would be a draw and a predetermined match for display only. And that's what happened. Now, later on, there was a rematch and Carlos... When he came back, his his technique was much better than the first match, and he actually broke Amore's arm with Udegarame. Udegarame is a straight arm bar or an inverted arm bar. So not a Jujigatame where you're doing a classic arm bar, but more of the arm bar where you're kind of breaking it over your shoulder, right? They, we call that Udegarame. And uh, Amore's arm broke, but he managed to escape the hold, and he never submitted, and so the match was declared a draw. Um, Amore would go on to fight George Gracie, Helio Gracie as well, with these fights also ending in draws. So this guy's a tough son of a bitch. Like he's hard to put away. And so are the Gracies. Very difficult to put away. In 1931, uh, he opened a judo academy, a judo academy in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And then unfortunately in 1938, um, this Amore character, he died at, uh, 39 years old from food poisoning. Some people say he was poisoned but there is no conclusive evidence for that. All right, so this guy, 
This guy Gio Amore is also like he's an important figure in the in the birth of jiu-jitsu. He trained with the Gracies, he fought the Gracies, and uh, really uh, just like Mitsuo Omeda, was very well versed in different grappling arts. And he is kind of, you know, in my studies, I realized, hey, this guy is like really known for someone who refined techniques, especially in real Valet Tudo situations. All right, let, let, let's go back to the Gracies now. So um, in July 3rd of 1931, there's this guy named uh, Jamie Ferreira. Now this, or Jame perhaps, is, I believe it's Jamie. And this guy is a capoeira guy. He ran a, a capoeira academy and he kind of established this mutual challenge between his school and the Gracies. So not necessarily that there was bad blood or anything, but they were just going to have this like mutual challenge. Okay, my style versus your style. We're, Three fighters from each school were sent. Now, this challenge, uh, it forced the fighters to wear geese, and it didn't allow strikes on the ground. So this is not valet tudo, okay? This is more of a grappling match. And uh, one of the capoeira students apparently broke one of the rules by striking George Gracie in the face. And the other two matches were won by the Gracie representatives, uh, Osvaldo Gracie and another guy named Benedicto Perez. So apparently the result of the match was negatively received. Uh, they were claiming that the rules were in too much in favor of the BJJ guys, okay? And that uh, they also said that this Ferreira guy was actually, he was actually a Greco-Roman wrestler and uh, he was teach he was associated with the Gracies and the Capoeira community basically said he is not fit to accurately represent the art of Capoeira. So even though you beat our guys, well, that doesn't really mean that you beat Capoeira because um, this... Ferreira character, he's not even a capoeira guy anyways. He's a Greco-Roman guy, so he's not with us. He's not a good representative for capoeira is essentially what they're saying, right? Um, in a challenge fight, uh, there was another one. Carlos, I'm just telling you guys about like different challenge fights that I sort of researched over time. Another one, Carlos Gracie, he fought this pro wrestler named Manuel Rufino Dos Santos. And this was slated for August 22nd in 1931. And this happened basically after this uh, Man Manuel Rufino, he criticized the Gracie family and called them out. So just like, just for a second, just put yourself back in, in this time frame and, you know, you're studying your Gracie Jiu-Jitsu and the guy down the street is studying Capoeira. And then there's another guy over there who does Greco. And then there's another guy over there who does catch wrestling. And, and essentially nobody likes each other, that nobody cross trains and everyone's like, well, fuck you. My style's the best. And uh, I'm going to challenge you, right? Like, it's just, it's kind of like the wild, wild west, right? It's kind of a, it's neat for me to think about as, as an outsider looking back on history, but a lot of these guys are thugs and gangsters as we're shortly going to hear about. And, uh, it's, it's kind of a crazy time where it's like, you know, it's my style versus your style and you don't know my secrets at this point. Techniques are very, very secretive. And it's not like nowadays where there's YouTube and instructionals and I can see what Gordon Ryan's working on nowadays or whatever. It's like, man, secrets are secrets. And you do not tell other, other uh, martial artists what you're going to do. It was a lot of their styles, and especially in these challenge matches, were based around the element of surprise, okay? So anyways, this... Pro wrestler, man, Noel Rufino, he challenges the oldest brother, Carlos Gracie, to a match, a fight. And after the fight announcement, uh, Carlos's teacher, Donato Pires, he, he said through a press conference that um, uh, gr that Gracie's claims to be an apprentice of Mitsuo Omeda were false. So he's saying, yeah, Gracie, he's not actually, he never trained with Mitsuo Omeda. Uh, and he says, Carlos is unfit to represent jiu-jitsu. And in response to these comments, Carlos and his brothers beat the shit out of Donato Pires the day before the event. Um, and <laughs> uh, after this assault, the ties to this Pires guy, because the Gracies were associated with this guy, they were severed and um, the Marquez de Abrantes Academy became full property of Gracies. So they were with this Donato Pires guy, the Gracies, and basically... Um, they assaulted the shit out of him the day before this so-called fight because Pires said they're not fit to represent jiu-jitsu. And so after that, the Gracies and the uh, Donato Pires lineage was no more. 
So <laughs> basically, as you'll soon learn, and my cat's here, he's just, he'll just chill probably, you know, uh, they're a bunch of thugs essentially. And they, if they don't like something you say, they're going to beat the fuck out of you. Oh, you can't see it right now, but my cat's right in front of the camera. Dude, you got to go, buddy. Okay. So according to the sources during this match, which is what I could see, the only professional match of Carlos's fight career, uh, Rufino actually dominated the majority of the match. And in the third round, he passes Carlos Gracie's guard and applies a submission. Now, Carlos defended by diving through the ropes. So if you can picture this, this is not on tatame. This is in a boxing ring, essentially, with ropes everywhere. And uh, diving through the ropes, I believe, was a legal move. You could you could exit the the ring if a submission was applied. And uh, apparently, sometime between them diving through the ropes and the time between them getting restarted, um, Carlos managed to lock in a guillotine on Rufino. And he had claimed that this Rufino character had tapped out. He said that he submitted. After much deliberation, the referees asked for the match to just restart. They, they couldn't find a decisive winner, and so they asked the match to restart. And then uh, Carlos was saying, hey, um, you know, I already won this match, essentially. I'm not going to. I'm not going to do it again. And he he refused to fight again. And so Rufino was declared the winner. Okay. Um, After this fight, Rufino went on to mock the Gracie skills in like public newspapers and whatnot. And this again resulted in Carlos, George, and Helio assaulting him in front of his place of teaching. (laughs) So if you piss off the Gracie brothers, they basically just come to your place and they beat the fuck out of you. Uh, and apparently, this, as the story goes, the Gracies ambush him at his place of teaching and they beat him with a, quote, steel box. And then they hold him down where Carlos now applied an arm bar that broke his arm and caused damage that required surgery. And so anyways, the three Gracie brothers that did this, they were arrested and they were sent to prison for two and a half years, but they were actually granted um, an early pardon due to their internal connections. These Gracies, they're connected. And, uh, after this, uh, <clears throat> after, um, Carlos retired from prize fighting, he focused on teaching jujitsu to his brothers and also to the national police. And then eventually he became a, a real estate investor. So <laughs> a little bit of a story on Carlos. Now let's just talk about Helio for a moment. Um, You know, Helio is the old bald guy that you saw with Hoist Gracie in the ring in the early UFC. Uh, He he was also known for his challenge matches under different rule sets. Valley Tudo, grappling, catch wrestling. Often there's no weight classes, there's no time limits with this. um, And against martial artists of all backgrounds, boxing, karate, catch wrestlers, capoeira, etc. He had multiple matches that went on for several hours. Okay, so often these matches are without time limit. And one of the most notable matches was against a Japanese legend. His name was Masahiko Kimura. I talked about this in episode three when we went into a deep dive on this gentleman, Masahiko Kimura. And in 1951, uh, Gracie lost by Gyako Uregarame, which is a, I believe, I'm not sure what the translation, I believe it's a reverse shoulder lock. And, uh, but that's the Kimura move, essentially. Uh, Check out episode three. I really, uh, I hope you like that one. I, I enjoyed doing that one. Uh, Helio and Carlos, they would both go on to establish Gracie Humeta in 1952, and it's still around today. The notable students from Gracie Humeta, it's like a who's who of names in the uh, household Gracie or household jiu-jitsu legends names. It's guys like Hicks and Gracie, Hoyler Gracie, Carlos Gracie Jr., Hoist Gracie, Halls Gracie, Megaton Diaz, uh, the Ribeiro brothers, Krong Gracie, so just like Tons of legends came from here. Now, Carlos actually, he died uh, with 21 children. So he, this guy did a lot of fucking. He, he had lots of kids. Apparently, back then, if you didn't have at least 10 kids, you were not a man, I guess. I don't know. Uh, Helio was also a father to seven sons and a couple daughters. Uh, he, some of Helio's sons, uh, some very famous names, Hickson, Horian, Helson, Hoys and Hoyler, and like I said, two daughters. Uh, his, he also, Helio's grandsons are also some pretty famous BJJ personalities, 
and entrepreneurs, uh, Henner Gracie, Horian Gracie, and Crone Gracie. He's an active ADCC, uh, or sorry, active UFC uh, fighter, and he's also an ADCC champion. So I have a funny quote here from Helio Gracie. Uh, I enjoyed it. So in his late years, Gracie was quoted as saying, quote, I never loved any woman because love is a weakness and I don't have weaknesses, end quote. (laughs) So just very much like you could just you could just see these Brazilians like the macho machismo, like uh, masculinity. uh, I don't have weaknesses. And if you say something about my family, we're going to fucking kill you. Like that's that's kind of uh, where these guys are coming from. And uh, pretty funny. So let's talk about just a, a. a quick thing that happened, the uh, the Gracie Academy versus the FADA Academy. So this is, this is an interesting clash of academies. In 1953, a gentleman named Oswaldo FADA, this is a guy who trained under a guy named Luis Franca. Uh, and Franca was a direct student of Mitsuo Meda around the same time that Carlos and Helio Gracie were. So Franca and his disciple... Osvaldo Fada, these guys are not part of the Gracie lineage. They are on, they are trained directly through Mitsuo Meda. Okay. And so Mitsuo Meda, he's teaching jujitsu to Luis Franca, and he's also teaching to Carlos and Helio. So it's a non Gracie lineage. And so, anyways, Fado, uh, he was kind of known for training poor people in Rio de Janeiro. And he was also very well known for the use of leg locks, which the Gracies considered low class and you know up, up until like 10 15 years ago that was still a common belief in the jiu-jitsu community was that leg locks are kind of cheap and it's a cheap way to win it's actually a very effective way to win very legitimate way to win but back then it was considered by the gracies to be of low class maybe they just didn't know what to do and maybe they thought uh we don't have this technology so we're just gonna label it as low class and then that way we won't have to learn it um and this Fada guy, he trained under a number of students, and he cha- he actually challenged the Gracie's Academy in 1953. And it's important to know that Fada's Academy actually won the majority of the matches versus the Gracie's. So that's kind of a cool story as well. All right, let's talk about another fight here. Helio Gracie versus a guy named Valdemar Santana. This happened in 1955. Helio Gracie was challenged by this uh, Valdemar Santana. This guy was actually a former student of the Gracie's Academy, and uh, the reasons why Santana left the Gracie team, uh, one reason is that he apparently took a professional wrestling bout, and that was something that uh, was forbidden in the Gracie Academy. Okay, another story tells of how Santana accidentally flooded the Gracie gym while he was cleaning and doing chores. Who knows? Okay, uh, a lot of these accounts are shady at best. Okay, but it, it, we'll just. <laughs> We'll leave it up to those two options because they're kind of funny. Now, uh, Gracie accepted this match in a, in the form of a, t- a Valley Tudo rule set. And even though Santana was 16 years younger and 60 pounds heavier, Helio Gracie accepted this match. Uh, they fought in May. They were, it was a gi match. They're both wearing a gi. And it lasted apparently for like four hours. So there's a no time limit match in the gi. Uh, and <laughs> just fucking insanity. Very, very little rules. Uh, apparently Helio, you know, he defended from his guard for most of the fight, being the smaller fighter. He was hitting elbows to the head and, uh, heel kicks to the back, which is something that you see Hoist use a lot in early UFC days. And while his opponent was throwing punch through the, uh, punches throw through the guard. So the guy's raining down blows and Helio's grabbing him and trying to tee off on his kidneys essentially. And after a long time, the Grace, uh, you know, Gracie got tired and, um, Santana kind of took over with, the use of headbutts and more strikes. In the end, Santana apparently he picked up Helio and he slammed him on the mat and landed a soccer kick to the guy's uh, head as Helio was kneeling and he was knocked out. And so the Gracie corner threw in the towel. And this is the final match of Helio's career. That was documented. Okay, so that's our little history lesson on Carlos and Helio Gracie. I want to talk about another Gracie right now. A guy who is basically, he was known as one of the best Gracies in terms of technical skill. 
He died tragically. His name was Halls Gracie. He was born in 1951. He died in 1982. At the age of 31, he died in a tragic hang gliding accident. But this guy was like a really talented fighter from the Gracie camp. He was known for his technique and his dedication and his potential. He was considered by Carlos Gracie Jr. to be the link between old jiu-jitsu and modern jiu-jitsu. He was, some call him the best Gracie fighter ever. That's his, that is often uh, a reputation that is attached to his name. This guy wanted to help jiu-jitsu gain more exposure through competition, and he did a lot of tournaments and Valley Tudo fights and other disciplines. So Halls Gracie is a name that you're definitely going to hear about. It's just, it's a shame that his life was tragically cut short. We never really saw what he could have done in the competitive modern jiu-jitsu arena. There's another guy, too, that we should mention. His name's Carlos Gracie Jr., or... His name is also Carlinos. He's still alive. He was born in 1956. He's the son of Carlos Gracie, obviously, and the brother to the late Halls Gracie that we just spoke about. Um, he's This guy is very influential in modern jiu-jitsu from an entrepreneurial standpoint. Carlos Gracie Jr., he founded Gracie Baja, so GB. That was in 1986. He also founded the IBJJF, and he founded Gracie Magazine. Um, he trained the Machado brothers, Carlos Hegan and Jean Jacques. And these guys are first cousins to Carlos Gracie Jr. and had established, uh, you know, pretty competitive careers in the Pan Am Championships and ADCC. So Hegan won the Pans a couple times. I'm pretty sure Jean Jacques won Pans, but he's uh, he also won ADCC, I believe, multiple times. And he did it with a hand without fingers. Jean Jacques Machado is a legend. He also went on to uh, the Machado's opened many, many schools. And uh, Jean Jacques Machado is also the. Um, He's the master of Eddie Bravo. So the 10th planet lineage runs through the Machado brothers, which runs through Carlos Gracie Jr. And now you can sort of see how the Gracie family tree has trickled down from these core brothers, uh, mostly Carlos and Helio, but also with the help of George, Gustav Jr., Osvaldo. And it all trickles down. Very, very cool. So now we're going to talk about the value of challenge matches in the history of jiu-jitsu. So guys, the reoccurring theme that I'm telling you guys throughout this episode is challenge matches, challenge matches, challenge matches. All these guys are from their own different disciplines. It's almost like UFC when it first started and you would see uh, a grappler fight a striker or a boxer fight a wrestler or a, or a kickboxer fight a jiu-jitsu fighter, right? So it's like very, very individual camps and very little cross-training or um, hybrid combinations of martial arts. At this time, it's like style versus style, and it's my gym versus that gym down the street, and it's my secrets versus their secrets, and we can't let them know our secrets. And so it was like, well, how are we going to get our martial art well known? How are we going to get more students? How are we going to get money? How are we going to get notoriety? We got to do challenge matches. And so the challenge matches are a critical point and a reoccurring theme in the history of jiu-jitsu, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, judo. So like... Uh, take a look at Jigoro Kano's Kodokan Judo when he took on the classical Koryo Jiu-Jitsu in episode one. Look at uh, Motemon Tanabe's Fusion Ryo Jiu-Jitsu and how it took over. Well, it, it actually got taken over by Kodokan Judo, but it defeated Kodokan Judo in challenge matches. And then look at guys like Yuki Otane and Mitsuyo Maeda and, um, and uh, Gio Omori that we spoke about in this episode and how they used... Uh, jiu-jitsu to introduce this fighting style in, uh, to the West through these challenge matches. And then, of course, maybe the most notable is the Gracie brothers using these challenge matches to push jiu-jitsu through Brazil and eventually the UFC in the Americas, right? So it's, it's a constant theme throughout the development of our art is challenge matches for money, and also to sort of see whose martial arts reign supreme, whose style is the best. We always see reoccurring challenge matches. Gi, no gi, limited rules, no rules, time limits, no time limit, like just crazy shit. And man, it must have been wild to, to go into a fight and to, you know, you're trying to, you know that your shit is legit, but you're also going against another guy with a completely different outlook on martial arts completely different training methodology, and he thinks his shit's legit too, and the rules are very, very limited. Uh, 
you know, you almost want to be a fly on the wall in some of these moments. It must've been super fucking cool. So now we're going to move on to what I just refer to as the revolution of BJJ. Okay. And this is essentially, uh, BJJ becoming mainstream through, I guess the UFC in the early nineties. So uh, while all this is happening, very few people in the West know about Gracie Jiu-Jitsu so far, okay? It is not a super popular thing. There's things like karate and things like that. Primarily striking arts, I would say. When people talk about martial arts during this time in the West, most people consider striking arts. Very few of them are considering grappling. Um, judo was popular, but... Most of the West focused on striking, boxing, taekwondo, karate, right? Uh, a lot of this was due to Hollywood's depictions of martial arts in the film industry. And a lot of these depictions of fighting lacked grappling completely. You know, you can even hear uh, in UFC 1 after Hoist Gracie wins, you can hear the announcer. He's like, we have learned, what did he say? We have, what we know about fighting will never be the same or something to that degree, right? Because you see this little guy in a gi beat the fuck out of these guys and make them tap out, make them give up. And he's like, man, like we thought that it would be some guy, some big boxer that would come in here and knock someone out. And like, that's the best fighter, right? We considered at the time, we considered Mike Tyson. He's the best fighter in the world, right? But nobody considered that the best fighter in the world might be a little guy in a gi. And it's so appropriate. He's like, what we know about fighting will never be the same after this. And it's so, so true. Um, <clears throat> pro wrestling was also becoming popular around the late 80s, early 90s time. Uh, but after it was discovered that pro wrestling was uh, rigged or predetermined, the idea of pro wrestling and catch wrestling, it kind of like lost a little bit of its legitimacy in the eye of the public, Okay. Um, people kind of looked at catch wrestling and pro wrestling like, well, but I know that's fake. So like, how is that legitimate? You know what I mean? Um, and this is a time when Gracie Jiu Jitsu was probably the closest thing to MMA or like a valet Tudo, uh, a combination of all fighting styles. Most of the martial arts at the time were practiced individually and MMA was not yet established as its own discipline. Nowadays, I look at MMA, which is a, of course, we all know, a combination of martial arts, boxing, kickboxing, wrestling, jiu-jitsu, judo, whatever. It is basically now its own discipline. The combination of these martial arts is now a discipline in itself, right? Uh, it's, it's not just a collection of styles. You have to have all of them and it is, it, it's, it's its own sport. It's its own discipline. And this was not really established yet at this time. Um, in 1993, Helio's son, Horian, he put together the Ultimate Fighting Championship, the UFC. It's a no-holds-barred challenge match, and it has very, very few rules. And this so-called Ultimate Fighting Championship would be a tournament that involved fighters from many different disciplines. I believe the only rules were no eye gouging, no fish hooking, no biting. I think that's it. You're allowed to punch to the groin. You're allowed to headbutt. You're allowed to uh, pull hair, right? Very, very few rules. And so <laughs> these were all different martial arts coming together in one tournament. It was not a bunch of MMA fighters coming together who all knew jujitsu, all knew wrestling, all knew how to strike. It is like a pure, pure boxer versus a pure wrestler, a pure judo fighter versus a pure kickboxer, a pure uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu fighter versus a Savat fighter, right? Or a Kyokushin fighter. Um, if you've never watched the first UFCs, it is fascinating. It is so interesting to see the lack of knowledge from everyone involved. The commentators don't really know what they're watching. All they know is when Hoist Gracie gets behind someone that he fucking strangles them. Even the referee doesn't know when the match is over, you'll see the guy tapping, tapping, tapping. And the referee is just standing there watching. He's like, what do I do? Do I stop this fight? Like we didn't know what fighting was at that time. We all expected a boxing match. We expect someone to get knocked out and they can't get back up. We didn't know that 
fighting would be dominated by Nawaza, ground fighting. Because once you're put on the ground, if you don't know what to do, you're fucked. You don't know how to get back up. You could be a world-class boxer, but your boxing is now useless, right? And this early invitation to the UFC, this introduction of this gentleman, Hoist Gracie, to the UFC really exposed how incomplete other martial arts are compared to Brazilian jiu-jitsu. So anyways, Helio's son, Hoist, who was born in 1966, was chosen to represent the Gracie family. And uh, he won the tournament. He's six feet tall, 176 pounds. He's not a sm small dude by any means, but he's not huge, okay? Um, Horian Gracie, the organizer of this event, he said he picked Hoist to represent the family's art because he was a skinnier dude with a smaller frame. He wanted to show that a smaller person could defeat a bigger person using jiu-jitsu, and uh, Hoist Gracie was not even known as the most talented Gracie fighter. He was just one of the Gracie fighters. There were other Gracies who were much higher ranked and in the training room could probably wax Hoist Gracie. But he wanted to pick someone who he, he said, okay, this guy's small and unassuming and I want that to be kind of our image. The smaller, weaker guy can beat the fuck out of a bigger guy, okay? And so Hoist used this Gracie jiu-jitsu that, uh, you know, that his family had been developing over the last uh, dec a couple decades to just devastating effect. He submitted his opponents. They had no idea what was happening. Uh, and this was a shock to the martial arts world as Gracie jiu-jitsu is pretty still relatively unknown. So we'll just go through the matches real quick. Match, and you can watch this all on YouTube. I recommend you do, guys. Uh, most of you, I'm sure if you're listening, you've watched the old UFCs. I don't think I have to convince you to, but if you have not, go to YouTube, look at, go watch those early UFC tournaments. I might do it, you know, in the next couple of days just because it is so fun to see. Um, and it's kind of like a science experiment, really. So match one, he had a quick defeat over this guy named Art Jimerson. This Art Jimerson guy is an American boxer. This is the guy who wears one boxing glove. I don't know what this guy was thinking going into the UFC with one boxing glove. It's like, this is my striking hand and this is my this is my grappling hand. I don't know what he was thinking, right? And basically he gets mounted by Hoist and he just starts panicking and he taps out. Okay, match two now was against a legit guy. This was versus a guy named Ken Shamrock. Ken Shamrock at the time was the king of pancreas. So he studied, uh, you know, pancreation, which is essentially like MMA. And uh, he was, he's also a, he would go on to be like a pro wrestling legend. I remember when I was a kid watching Ken Shamrock do ankle locks to people in, in the WWF and whatnot. And, uh, you know, th the world's most dangerous man, they called him. And uh, in this fight, Hoist shot on Ken Shamrock. Shamrock sprawled, and this would result in Gracie ending up on the bottom, pulling guard. Keep in mind, this is now a gi versus no gi match. You know, Shamrock is going no gi, and <laughs> Gracie's wearing his traditional jiu-jitsu gi. Now, uh, from this situation, from this guard situation, Shamrock actually sits back on a heel hook. So he's trying to attack the leg, and this actually pulled Hoist Gracie on top. So he pulled him to the top position. And from here, Shamrock kind of turned over and Hoist strangled him using his gi. Now, the ref actually didn't initially see the tap, which I find crazy. If you watch the footage, it looks pretty obvious that he was tapping in front of the ref. But apparently the ref said he didn't see it. And then Hoist let it go. And uh, the referee ordered the fight to continue. There was some back and forth. You can even see in the footage, Hoist kind of yelling at Shamrock and, and I guess he's yelling, you fucking tapped and all this shit. And then eventually Shamrock admits defeat and later he would go on to say, I admit that it was defeat because it, it was a legit victory. It wouldn't be fair if I kept fighting, right? And then in the finals, Hoist Gracie, uh, in the finals of UFC 1, Hoist Gracie goes on to fight this Dutch guy, uh, a Kyokushin fighter and a Savat world champion. His name was Gerard Gordou, uh, to fight, and he would win this uh, $50,000 purse. If you don't know what Kyokushin karate is, it's pretty fucking insane. It's badass. It's uh, essentially, imagine kickboxing, but you're not allowed to punch to the face. So you're allowed to punch to the body, you're allowed to kick to the body, you're allowed to kick to the head, but you're not allowed to punch to the head. So it's just dudes rattling off body shots and... Uh, trying to knock each other out by kicking each other in the head. And it's 
Kyokushin karate fighters are historically known to be incredibly tough people because of all the punishment they take in training. I've trained jujitsu with a couple of Kyokushin karate fighters and mentally they are like unbreakable because they're so used to getting hit and just keep keeping on coming, especially body shots, right? So now Hoist has got to fight this Gerard Gordou in this finals match, this Kyokushin Savat world champion. And anyways, Gracie uses the methods that we talked about uh, with Maeda's philosophy to combat uh, previously in the episode. So he quickly closes the distance on Gordo and he takes him down with an inside trip, uh, sorry, an outside trip, and immediately transitions to mount where he starts to use uh, like headbutts and things like that. And they're head to head. So apparently Gerard was, uh, Gracie later said that Gerard actually bit him during the fight, breaking the rules. And Gracie responded by strangling him. And after you can see uh, this Gordo guy tapping out furiously and Gracie's refusing to let go. He's trying to put him to sleep. And I don't think he did put him to sleep, but he was he had some bad intentions behind that strangle. He was trying to he's trying to strangle him as long as he could. And also from the previous match with Shamrock, he's probably like, hey, I'm going to make sure that this ref pries me off of this guy because I am not giving up the strangle until he physically removes my arms from his neck. I'm going to make sure there's, you know, no doubts about it. And, uh, and yeah, Hoist Gracie, man, like this guy is kind of the poster boy or the face associated with the introduction of BJJ to MMA. And he would go on to win three UFC tournaments in total. He went on to uh, fight in Pride Championship in Japan. He's said to have written open letters to the top martial artists in the world, one of them including Mike Tyson, who is serving jail time, where Hoist is basically saying, I'll fight you, Mike Tyson. It was fucking crazy. We never saw that fight. Um, And after the the world sort of witnessed this effectiveness of jiu-jitsu, it was solidified as an essential part of martial arts combat. It couldn't be denied anymore. You know, after you put these, the top, fighters from these different disciplines into a cage and we see who wins and Gracie dominates everyone, you cannot deny the effectiveness of Brazilian jiu-jitsu anymore. It's like the announcer said, maybe I'm messing up the quote, what we know about combat will never be the same. Anyways, uh, for for a few years, Brazilian jiu-jitsu or Gracie jiu-jitsu as they called it at the time, it remained a dominant discipline in no holds barred fighting. Uh, but people would eventually start training this Gracie jiu-jitsu and they would learn the techniques and the strategies of, of, of the art. Uh, it's a crucial moment in our sport and the sport of MMA. You absolutely need to be well-versed in ground fighting if you're going to win a hold, no holds barred match or an MMA match. There's no fighter in the UFC that doesn't know jiu-jitsu now. It's impossible, okay? Um, because if you don't know jiu-jitsu, you're fucked. And, and we learned that from the early UFC days. And we maybe the Gracies knew it before the introduction of the UFC, but they just didn't have the proper platform on such a grand scale to prove it. But after UFC won, they couldn't deny it anymore. The legitimacy, legit, excuse me, the legitimacy of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu was now, you know, undisputed. And anyways, it doesn't necessarily mean that... I, I don't, I don't believe that BJJ is the core of MMA. Many say that the best core martial art for MMA is actually wrestling, but it exposed the weaknesses of the other fighting systems in a real fight, standing fighting systems, even wrestling. Like you could say wrestling is the core of MMA or wrestling is the best style to have going into MMA. However, if you're a wrestler going into MMA and you don't know jujitsu, you're fucked. <laughs> You could take someone down, but if you don't know how to defend from the, uh, you know, when you're in someone's guard, you you will absolutely, absolutely be exposed. And Hoist proved that. So anyways, Hoist would go on to fight in Japan. He would eventually return to the UFC years later. He feuded uh, later on his career with many names. Of course, Ken Shamrock, Kazushi Sakuraba, uh, Matt Hughes. You know, these are all like vintage UFC matches that Again, if you've never seen them, this is like a really fun era in the history of UFC. If you ask me, much more fun than now. It was much more fun when it was guys that were coming from individual disciplines and MMA was still kind of a cool experiment. Nowadays, everyone's so good. 
Everyone knows the game of MMA. The strategies are updated. Everyone knows jujitsu. So you don't really see guys outclassing each other. You don't really see like big blowouts where one style is clearly more significant and superior than the other one. But back then you did see that and it was a really cool time in fighting. And I really recommend you all to go check that out. Uh, Gracie lost to this Kazushi Sakuraba in a uh, the 2000 Pride Grand Prix Finals. So it was a tournament that Pride had. Pride is a very fun uh, MMA promotion to watch from Japan. And this loss to Sakuraba earned the Japanese fighter the nickname the Gracie Hunter. Uh, Sakuraba was, he went on to defeat multiple Gracies. Uh, he also, Hoist got, uh, Gracie got caught doing steroids in 2007 after he actually defeated Kazushi Sakuraba in their rematch. They said that they found the drug Nandrolone in his system in a post-fight drug screen. Many other Gracies uh, fought in MMA in the UFC in Japan. Names like Hoyler Gracie, an ADCC legend, Hicks and Gracie, Henzo Gracie, one of the authors of the book Mastering Jiu-Jitsu and Master of John Danaher, and also Crone Gracie, who we mentioned earlier in the episode. So nowadays, Hoist Gracie, he's focusing on teaching jiu-jitsu. He has affiliates all over the world under the Hoist Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Network. He's a seventh degree Corel, Blel, uh, Corel belt. Uh, and a fun fun thing about Hoist Gracie, he, it is said here that he wears a dark blue belt when training Brazilian jiu-jitsu to pay homage to his father, Helio Gracie, who wore a blue belt in training. <laughs> and why would these legends in jiu-jitsu wear a blue belt? I think it's kind of like, to say, hey, I'm always going to be a blue belt. Like, I'm always a student. And uh, it's it's kind of cool. And I've seen pictures of these guys wearing blue belts, but I didn't know that they actually did that until I studied. So to some degree, all jiu-jitsu, should I say, all BJJ practitioners are part of this lineage. Jigoro Kano, Mitsuyo Maeda, Carlos Gracie, Hilo Gracie, Helio Gracie, and then from there it all branched off. Um, nowadays, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, as we all know, it's becoming increasing, increasingly popular uh, in the mainstream world and celebrities and other famous people are starting to train in it. You know, you always hear about celebrities getting into Jiu-Jitsu. Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Elon Musk, Demi Lovato, Ashton Kutcher, uh, Jonah Hill, Usher. The, a lot of these celebrities actually train with Higan Machado who is one of the Machado brothers. He's well known for training a lot of Hollywood celebrities. So it's becoming quite popular. And every other year that the ADCC championships happen, especially with guys like Gordon Ryan and of course his coach, John Danaher, it becomes more of a mainstream thing because people are starting to become interested in it. You know, and it's and the Nogi aspect of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is a, it's quite spectator friendly. So I think we're only going to see Jiu-Jitsu move forward from here. And of course, uh, BJJ, it's only going to grow from here because it is realistic. It's safe to train for the most part if you do it properly. And it's fun. And you, you meet awesome people doing it. And that's it. You know, that's the uh, that's what I got for you guys today. I just want to finish with a quick quote here from Mr. Ricardo Almeida. Ricardo Almeida is a student under Henzo Gracie, and he's actually um, one of the senior instructors to John Danaher, which is crazy to think about John Danaher having senior instructors. When Je John Danaher started, um, you know, Ricardo Almeida was one of the top guys, ADCC veteran, UFC veteran. Uh, he has a cool quote here. Jiu-Jitsu, oh, sorry, and I quote, Jiu-Jitsu and martial arts do not build character. They reveal it. We are all born with unmeasurable courage and determination, but it is as we go through the trials of rigorous training that we rediscover those gifts, end quote. And uh, yeah, that's basically Ricardo Almeida saying it's it's all of these things that we gain in jiu-jitsu, it's always been inside of us, but only through the training and the the determination, the discipline, the struggle, the discomfort the camaraderie, uh, only through those things and through time does jujitsu reveal those things within you. And uh, it's a wonderful quote. I love it. Guys, 
it's been so fun talking about this stuff. The last episode, of course, we went through the history of the samurai, how j- Japanese jiu-jitsu started, um, you know, the Newaza revolution, how Jigoro Kano created Kodokan Judo, how that eventually got defeated by uh, the Fusen Ryo, and, and how... Uh, you know, he basically absorbed all this Nawaza into judo, made it an Olympic sport, how he exported it to the rest of the world, and how guys like uh, Matsuyo Maeda and uh, Gio Omori and uh, uh, what's the gentleman's name here, Yuki Otani, how they all moved throughout the world to spread this Kodokan judo, and then how Brazilian jiu jitsu organically grew from there through the Gracie family. We talked about the Gracie lineage. And, you know, a lot of different challenge matches, how challenge matches played such a pivotal role in this story and how it kind of surfaced through the generations and eventually through Hoist Gracie to the UFC and then other MMA promotions are coming uh, coming to light. And now all these different MMA fighters that now have a place where they can perform and, and, and fight each other and how Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu has really changed the landscaping, <laughs> landscaping, changed the landscape of fighting forever and now it's a sport of of its own you know i love jiu-jitsu as you all know i'm sure you all love jiu-jitsu otherwise you wouldn't be listening to the show and uh (laughs) you know it's been cool to talk about the history and the different figures in our history and i really do hope that you learn something from this and even though i couldn't talk about you know all the characters who were involved and all the matches that have happened it is cool and it's humbling to reflect and it, it just, for me, as an instructor, as a coach, it motivates me to pass on the jiu-jitsu I do know and also try to help my young students create a career in this art so that they can have a life as awesome as mine, teaching jiu-jitsu and training all day and and doing podcasts and doing seminars and, and trying to monetize uh something that they love to do and make a career out of it. There's nothing more special than that. And if I can help you guys or help any of my students do that, um, you know, maybe that can be my contribution to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Anyways, guys, I hope you enjoyed the show. If you want to support the show, check out the links below. The best way to do it is please subscribe to my online Academy. I don't have like a premium podcast set up where you can donate money to. But if you do want to give me money, if you do want to help me keep the lights on, and I would greatly appreciate it if you do, please sign up at my online academy. It's 10 bucks a month. You get access to all of my lessons and all of my content that I put out. Almost have content coming out every day. You can buy my kids book. Uh, Please share the podcast, like, share, subscribe. Try and spread the word if you enjoyed it. I'm all at a time, guys. Thank you so much. Remember, The Essential Jiu-Jitsu Podcast is everything that you need to know about Jiu-Jitsu. I love you guys. Bye.